for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, February the 22nd, 1998. Final service of the Ladies' Conference being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Mary Ann Flynn of the Los Angeles area is Speaker of the Morning. Uh, I, really, I have enjoyed just every minute of it. Every, every part of the body has something to add, doesn't it? Oh, and God wants to use us because each one of us has something to add. We have our own uh, peculiar little song to sing. <laughs> Don't we? I just love that. I just love that. I told Glenn I've got to be sure and get a copy of all these tapes. But if he can't, if he can't send me a copy of all, for goodness sakes, send me one uh, that has her songs in it, for goodness sakes. But I want them all. It's, it's just wonderful. I want to... I can just think of friends and relatives to share all of this with. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I have, really, I have so much to share with you. It's, it's just uh, three days, just three, uh, three times, three sessions. And so, you know, I just try to crowd it all into each session because I want you to go back. If I can just start you thinking in, in a line, that's wonderful. Because then you can go and you can investigate. And God can give you so much more revelation than what I can say. Isn't that wonderful? May the Lord cause our ears to hear more than we're hearing. I love to go to a church where the, the minister can say just one thing and the Lord just absolutely seals it to me. And I go home and he just expands it and expands it. By the time I go to another meeting, it's a whole session. Hallelujah. This is what I like to do for you. But I appreciated what Mildred shared because I think it's something that the Lord wants to bring back. To our attention is the fact, as we brought out the very first night, first of all, if we can believe that God is in Jesus, as we said Friday night, and Jesus is in God, in the Father, and they are in us. Isn't that what the Bible says? Say, I'm trying. They are in us. Say, they are in us. And the Holy Spirit is in me. And I am in them. The Bible declares it. All right, then the Bible declares something else. The Bible declares that we, the Bible declares that we were crucified with Him. Let's say, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. But Christ liveth in me. Hallelujah. And the life I now live. I live by faith of the Son of God. Who loved me and gave his life for me. Hallelujah. I just feel the presence of the Lord when we say it. We have been crucified. That means we're dead with Christ. We were in him because of the blood. Because of accepting the blood that automatically made us dead in him. In fact, I thought of the spiritual aspect. First of all, the Bible is right. It says, after death, the judgment. But we've been crucified with Christ. There's the death spiritually. Hallelujah. There's the spiritual aspect of it. And we've done what? We've judged our sins. We've said, I have sinned. I have done wrong. This has been wrong in my life. I reject it. I refuse it. I renounce it. It no longer has any part in my life. I put it from me. And we've judged it. They don't fall. So those things do not follow us up. Hallelujah. But the Bible also says that we not only died with Him, but we were raised with Him. In newness of life. Not are going to be. We were raised with Him. Hallelujah. In newness of life. Whenever we really get a mindset in this, we'll start so respecting the words of our mouth that we will know that when we declare something, that it is. It's not, we're going to hope it. Oh, we're just going to say it so hard and so long, and that's okay, too. You know, don't cut out anything. Enjoy it all. Hallelujah. The quiet times, the loud times, the exciting times, the times that aren't exciting, but God is still there. It's nothing. Everything remains the same. Nothing changes. Hallelujah. But when we get a mindset, we'll know that whenever we speak it out, 
it's established for us. Oh, if, if Isaac had it way back there, didn't Isaac have it? He respected what he said because he knew God was listening to it and establishing what he was saying. Isn't that right? Because whenever he gave the blessing to Jacob and then along came Esau and said, No, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. I want the blessing. And what did Isaac say? Oh, cancel, cancel. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's get back. Okay. Now we're going to give the blessing now to, to, to Esau. Did he say that? No. He said, I have given the blessing. Then, to, already, it's gone from my lips and it's established. Amen. When we get a mindset that we were crucified with Christ, we were risen with Christ. But do we have the mindset that we also ascended with Him? Did we ascend with Him? Ephesians two six. If you really want to see, maybe we. I hadn't intended to go there, but I tell you, the anointing of the Lord is here. For He loves it when we talk about Him. Ephesians 2, 6. We'll just go there for a minute or two. Since it's just us here this morning anyway. Hallelujah. We're having a good time. Oh, oh goodness. How, where can I start? Uh, let's start with four. But God. Don't you love that? But God. Exclamation point. But God. And thanks be unto God for what he's done for me. For had I not found him. But God. Hallelujah. So rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. He has such an intense love that he had to satisfy it. And so even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, uh, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. The same new life. With which he quickened him. As our sister said. Another scripture says. And if that same spirit. That raised Christ from the dead. If it dwells in you. How many of you it dwells in? Then he will also quicken your. Mortal bodies. And we can expect to be quickened. And whenever there's a need or whenever God needs to talk to us, He'll just quicken us. This is the realm I want to encourage you to walk in and to expect. Because there's great power in expectation. Remember that. There's power in expectation. And whenever you expect it, it comes to pass in your life. But you have to know about it. Be convinced of it. And then expect it. It shall also quicken our mortal bodies. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, by his favor and mercy, that you did not deserve, that you are saved and delivered from judgment. That's the final judgment. And you're made partakers of Christ's salvation. Okay. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together. That doesn't just mean that he raised us up from the dead because the scripture tells us in another portion he raised us up with him from the dead. But now this is a higher raising. He raised us up together with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere. Hallelujah. In the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. How many of you know that you're sitting in heavenly spheres? Isn't that what the Bible tells us another portion? He has, uh, what? He has caused us to sit together. He has given us the mind of Christ. And we have joint seating with Him. Hallelujah. We're not just dead in Christ, raised in Christ, but we have ascended. And we are sitting together with Him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. <sighs> I tell you what, the enemy has kept us from having the full realization and living in the midst of it. But uh, it's time that we awake, know who we are. And as I was thinking, part of the theme of this has been that we praise and worship. We know that, don't we? But beyond that, it's a pressing in with praise and worship. 
a pressing in. And you know what that pressing in means? It means that whenever you go back home, I'm always considering and considered with the ladies who come up. A lot of times we meet on mountaintops. Mount Palomar, there's been lots of, and, and this is probably a um, portion of a mountaintop here. And I'm concerned that whenever they, they're, they're, they get the victory and they're excited here and there is such an atmosphere that we can just lay it all out and let it all go. Hallelujah. But then I know that the ladies go back and, you know, uh, maybe the husband meets them at the door. You know, maybe not too happy. All of a sudden, the daily life descends again. You know, daily life. Yes, the other realities. This is the greater reality. <laughs> but the daily life comes. But then whenever you're there again and the washing has piled up while you're gone. And your husband doesn't understand why it's not done even though you've been gone. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly the chores are there again. And suddenly the enemy wants to offer you uh, discouragement again. And he wants to begin to make you feel guilty again. And he wants to offer you all of the things that you let go of at the retreat. That's the time to press in. You learned how to press in here, how to worship, how to praise. But the time to press in is whenever you're feeling your lowliest and the loneliest, some of you. And you're there alone, and it starts to come back again. That's the time you press in. You raise up your hand. You begin to just dance. And, you know, and maybe you think, I don't feel like dancing. It's all me just raising my hand. But I'll tell you what, if you'll keep doing it and saying, the virtuous woman rejoices and she twirls because her name is written. All of a sudden, I'll tell you, the power of the Lord will come down. How do I know I've been there, done that? Hallelujah. And it works. And another thing we need to find out about press is this. Yes, we press, but that means to crowd, to squeeze, to hurl yourself against. That's how Jesus could go, get in a boat, and fall asleep, and sleep in a tremendous storm. While the disciples are despairing of their life, the Lord is sleeping peacefully. One thing, he had the peace. And another thing, he was tired. It says that he couldn't do some things for the what? For the press. Did you know that people were crowding against him, squeezing against him, and some were so anxious to get to him, they were hurling themselves against him. That's what press means, to hurl oneself against. So hurl yourself whenever you are beginning to worship and praise. Just get into it, and God will take over. We've been seated with him in heavenly places. That's just, that was just completely free this morning. Praise God. But I felt so, I, I just was so encouraged by what the Lord has been doing, what he's been saying, that I just, I had to get into that. Last night, last night, we found out about Jeroboam. We found out that all of the wonderful promises that he received, but he staggered at the promises. We found out we don't want to stagger at the promises. We have them and we're going to believe them. And we also found about out, and, and, and with Jeroboam, it was pride. It was the desire for power that caused him to do that. And then we found out about the young man who had received the promises, who had received word from the Lord. And we found out that it was because he was deceived. He allowed himself to be deceived that he fell off of the path of obedience and the path that would have led him to his wonderful destiny that God had ahead of him. And now there is the counterpart to Jeroboam and to this young man of God from Judah. And I thought, Lord, I just can hardly think of a better counterpart in the Old Testament than Joseph. He's absolutely the counterpart of Jeroboam. Because Joseph, what? He did just like Jeroboam. He received the promises of God, didn't he? You're going to be powerful. You're going to have authority over people, even your family. is going to recognize and be under that authority. Great promises that Joseph had, just like Jeroboam. But what happened? Well, Jeroboam began to wonder. He began to worry. Be considered. The enemy is always on the work. Well, in Joseph's life, sure enough, there was the enemy working. What, and what happened to Joseph? He went into a pit. We know that. Isn't that right? It didn't sound like much authority to me, did it? And you know, we received the promises. We're going to be able to move mountains. We're going to speak in demons flee. You know what? I believe that. And I believe in it more every day. 
And I believe it so much that one day I'm just going to speak. And a demon will cry out and leave. Hallelujah. And here's Joseph. He's in a pit. And not in a wonderful circumstance. But he has got the promise of God. And apparently he never let it go. Why? Because we can see on down the road to the end of Joseph's life. He not only was in the pit. But then you think, well, it can't get any worse than this. And sure enough, it got worse. He was sold into a camel train, a Midianite camel train, going into Egypt. And you know what? I'm sure that the enemy came to him and said, now, you see, you thought the dream was from God. You thought you heard from God. You thought it was God moving on you. Are you placing yourself there? And yet, look, you're getting farther, further, and further from the promise. Well, maybe the promise could have come to pass. You know, before, well, even while you were in the pit, maybe you'd have been lifted out. But now, look, you're going into a foreign country. Now you're a slave. You're in bondage. Now you're getting further and further from the promise. And you know what? That was the voice of the enemy. Because let me tell you something. He was getting closer and closer to the fulfillment of the promise of God. To the fulfillment of his destiny. I tell you what, ladies, it doesn't matter what you go home to. It doesn't matter what comes in the days, what the enemy offers you. Our attitude is, I'm closer and closer to my destiny. It's a good destiny. It's a good path that I'll live the good life. And it doesn't matter if it looks like I'm getting further and further away. I'm getting closer and closer. That is the promise of God. And you know, the Bible, oh, I tell you, the Bible tells us, That even whenever he got into Egypt, he was taken into Potiphar's house as a slave. I just imagine here Potiphar had another slave. But, you know, we read in the Word of God, and I'm going to read it just quickly out of Genesis, the 39th chapter. And it's it's in verse 2, and it says, But the Lord was with Joseph. I want you to know that when you leave here, the Lord is going to be just as with you as when you were here. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he, though a slave, though going through a circumstance, he just is not, just would have rather not been in. Have you ever been in a circumstance you'd rather not be in? A captivity? A prison? You see, I'll read this, and then we'll, we'll give you the three Ps. The Lord was with Mo- Joseph, even though he was a slave. He was successful and a prosperous man. Though a slave in a foreign country, God was with him, and he was successful and prosperous in that captivity. That's what God wants for us. If you get into a place, a situation you'd rather not be in, you can still declare, but I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be prosperous. I'm going to have favor. Hallelujah. And the Lord is going to deliver me out of this circumstance. It will end. You know, I love the phrase that says, and it came to pass. God never leaves us in a circumstance. It will pass. And the quicker that we begin to praise Him, the quicker that we realize that nothing has changed. He still loves us. He's still in us. And He wants us to pass through the circumstances. And if He allows us to go through it, apparently it's going to strengthen us. It's going to get us on through to our destiny. Hallelujah. Apparently, it's good for us because the Bible declares, and I believe it, that all things. How many things work together for good? All. All things. There's another mindset that we need to get. And then we need to declare it. Hallelujah. While we're gathering up the wash, whatever it is that we're doing, whenever we're going down setting up chairs, all things we'll say to ourselves right out loud so our ears can hear it. It needs to go in all the gates that we have, our eye gate, our ear gate, and out our mouth gate. Because I want you to know something. There are great and powerful forces waiting at the corners of our mouth for authority to go and perform it. We don't give the enemy any authority. But we give the Lord, we give the angels, hallelujah, authority to work on our behalf. The Bible declares that the Lord is our great high priest. Hallelujah. He's our brother. Apostle of our profession, and he's our high priest. And he's up there offering as a high priest to the Father. The only thing we can send up there right now, what can we send up? Our words, our praises, our singing. We can send that up. 
And whenever we say, Lord, this is something I'd rather not be in, but I believe the word that says all things work together for good, and I believe you're going to deliver me out of this, and whenever I'm delivered out of it, I won't be on the same level that I was, because even the Bible declares that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't. We know that we walk through circumstances. Isn't that right? Some of us, of us it is the shadow of the v- valley of the shadow of death. So, feels like it. It hurts so bad. But you know what that word walk means? It doesn't mean I'm walking through the valley and I'm finally going to come out at the other side and I'm going to kind of recover. But that word walk means on an upward incline. Hallelujah! When I go through a valley, when I go through a captivity, I'm not going to come out the same as I was. I'm going to come out on a higher level, higher ground. You know, I, I, I sat here yesterday and I thought, I wish she'd sing higher ground. Hallelujah. The Lord must have heard me and put it in your heart. And if you planned it ahead of time, he still heard me and put it in your heart. If you planned it six months ago, he still heard me. Because he says, before you call, I will answer. And whenever something seems like, uh-oh, I should have been praying about that. Now it's too late. Uh-uh. Call on the Lord. Talk to the Lord about it because he says, before you call, I'll answer. And so he is the God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of tomorrow. And he's in control. It's all the same to him. Praise the name of the Lord. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he, though a slave, was a successful and prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You know, we don't see that he was plotting all kinds of things against his master. We don't see that he was stubborn and rebellious, and the master had a hard time with him. I believe he got in there in the circumstances and done the best that he could, and God blessed him in doing it. And here's the three P's for your notes. The first P is, let me tell you what, God has given us his promises. The first P. We receive the promises in the Word. We receive them in song, as I said the other day. We receive them through a word of knowledge or a spoken word or a prophetic word. Oh, it's wonderful when we receive it. But if. I don't say look for it. I don't say it always has to be. But if. We go through a captivity, a prison, a pit. Potiphar's. That's all the second P. Do you notice all of them are P's? Prison? Pit? Potiphar's house? But if we go through a captivity, I want you to know something. That the third P is on the way. I feel like Carmen. You know, Friday, it may seem like Friday, but Sunday's on the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The third P, if we'll say no, but the the third P is on the way. Whenever I make it through, whenever I praise, whenever I hold fast, Whenever I speak the things that I should speak, no matter how my heart may be feeling, I tell my heart to shut up and speak the words of the Lord. Isn't that what David did? He spoke to his heart and told her to be quiet. Quit bothering him. His eyes were on the Lord. Praise God. God established his house forever. Praise God. Oh. The third P is what? The provision. The provision. You get through that middle P. Hallelujah. You're walking on an upward incline. And you're going to come out to the provision. Joseph made it all the way to the provision. Hallelujah. Jeroboam didn't because he staggered at the promise. But Joseph maintained his integrity with God. We know he did because of the way that it ends up. What does he do? He's even accused. There was opportunity in Potiphar's house to kind of uh, stagger a little at the promise and help himself out, like Jeroboam tried to help himself out, you know. And I'm sure the enemy must have come to Joseph and said, oh, now here, you know, if you get in good with Potiphar's wife, you know, things are going to get even better and better. You never know what can end up this way. And I'm sure the enemy spoke to him like that because we're all the same people, aren't we? You know how he tempts? How we like to help God out? Every chance we get? God doesn't need any help. He can handle that job all by himself. Praise God. But you know what? He was, his eyes were on the Lord. He was full of integrity even in the prison. He wasn't mad at God. We need to examine our lives sometimes and see if we're mad at God. Or maybe just a little ticked off at him. Or maybe just a little bit disappointed with him. Because, you know, he didn't ask and we prayed and we believed and we were, you know, and and he didn't do it. I tell you, we need to get all of that out of our heart. 
Because God does all things for our good always. And we need a mindset on that. But you know, Joseph kept his integrity even though it cost him. And it landed him in, in prison. Right out of Potiphar's house and in prison. Oh, well, I'm going to read this too because it's just so good. I just can't get off of it. If we stay in Genesis 39, Joseph gets into prison. Joseph master took and put him in the prison. Oh, that master had control over Joseph. That master could do with Joseph what he wanted to, he thought. But in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. I want you to know the Lord is with us. Even when we feel worse, even whenever we fail, even whenever we, we think, yesterday I wasn't my best, the Lord is still with us because of his great love. We read about his great love. And showed him mercy and loving kindness and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. You can have favor wherever you are. Just say, Lord, Joseph had favor. You're no respecter of persons. I want favor. I'm going through this, but I'm going through it in favor. I'm going through it in prosperity. I'm going to be blessed in this circumstance. And whenever I come out, I'll be even greater blessed. And verse 22 tells us, And the warden of the prison committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatsoever was done there, he was in charge of it. He makes you in charge even when you're in captivity. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in charge in their captivity. Isn't that right? They're brought over slaves for the use of the king. But God knows how to raise us up out of our captivity. But you know what he usually does? He usually waits for this living earth to move first. Do you know that? We say, oh, God, move. And the Lord says, you move. Oh, but Lord, if you'll just move, if you'll just bring in an abundance of finances, if you'll just do this, if you'll just change my husband, if you'll just change my child, then you know what I'll do. I'll just sing and, and, and uh, play the praise tapes, all the, and I'll do that. And the Lord says, you do that. You do that. You do that. Whenever the, the, uh, whenever the crowd was, the, the armies were thirsty and out of water, and they said, cry to the Lord for us. We're facing an enemy, and we are not going to be able to overcome because our animals are thirsty. They'll not be able to help us. We're dying of thirst. Lord, send water. And the Lord says, dig ditches. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, Lord. We're thirsty. We're in need. We need deliverance from this circumstance. If you want ditches, Doug, give us water, and we'll dig ditches. The Lord says, dig ditches. Trust me. Just trust me. Hallelujah. And uh, the, this living earth had to dig ditches, had to move first. And if you check it out in the Word of God, almost always, He expects the earth to move. Whatever you bind, expect heaven to respond. Whatever you lose, it isn't, I'm going to bind. Now you get down there and you do the same. He says, whatever you bind, you move. And the Bible says it rained. It rained off in another place. They couldn't even see the cloud. They couldn't even hear the sound of thunder. Off in another place. Here they were there. Here's these dry dishes, ditches. There's, they're more thirsty than they've ever been. Now, and what happens? They go to bed that night and there's thirst. Their tongues are drying up. But I tell you in the morning, haven't I told you in the morning? Things can change and be different. They got up in the morning and every ditch they had dug was full of water. Every ditch they didn't dig didn't have any water. If you talk to my husband, it makes perfect sense to me. He knows my logic. But every ditch they had dug was full of water. Now, I tell you what, God wanted them to know something. God could have sent water any old way. He could have spoken to a rock. Isn't that right? He could have caused it to bubble up out of the ground like he did for, for Hagar. He could do all kinds of things. But God had a plan. God's got a plan. God has a plan. The Word says he has a plan for every one of our life. And the way he does it is the very best way. It's the very best. And see, God's plan was, yes, I'm going to give you water. I want to give you water. I want to bless you. 
And you may not understand why I want you to move first. But you see, if I'd have bubbled it up out of the ground, or if I'd have caused a rock to be opened, it wouldn't have defeated your enemy. But what I want is I want all these ditches laying out there. So that when I send the water quietly, so the enemy will not know that's rain. The enemy will not even suspect you've got water. Hallelujah. Whew. The Lord loves to hide us from our enemy. Ah, he wants us living in the secret place, abiding in him. Hallelujah. And so the enemy had no clue. They were clueless. Hallelujah. Our enemy can be clueless. He's not all knowledge. He's not all knowing. And he's not omnipotent. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have more potent than he does. Isn't that right? I give you power over all the power of the devil. Praise God. <laughs> oh, the enemy comes in great power. We remember and we have a mindset that we have more power. We have power over all his power. And so we find out that the enemy gets up the next morning and they say, boy, they must be half dead by now. Yes, they must be half dead. We're just going to, good night. They said, look out there at that valley. And the Bible says, it's, isn't it interesting, the sun shone just in a special, peculiar little way upon that water that were in those ditches, just by God's accident. And it's, it, it shone red to the enemy. And of course, Israel had been feasting and drinking and well fortified. Their animals had been drinking, and you know, the enemy gets up, uh, looks out there, and they say, would you look at all that blood? Why... Those men must have gotten so discouraged, those, those soldiers, until they just started fighting one another. Look at all that bloodshed out there. What? Don't take your big sword. D just, just bring a little knife. We can, we can finish. If there's any yet alive, we can finish them off. Let's, and an unprepared enemy went out to meet a well-prepared army. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they completely destroyed their enemy. Hallelujah. That was God's plan. That was God's way. He disarmed the enemy and gave them a great victory with much less loss than it would have been, than it could have been. God's way is always better. But he expects us to act just like Daniel. How was Daniel able to be ruling and reigning in the land of his captivity? The living earth acted first, didn't it? Isn't that what we read in Daniel, the first chapter? Daniel looks around here. He's a captive. He can do one of two things. Probably, or more. He can uh, either cooperate and just live for the Lord, let love and mercy shine through him the way that he really is. Or he can, uh, you know, plan uh, uh, strategies for uh, uh, messing up the, uh, there, the palace, you know, for creating little fires in the palace or for escape plan. There's a lot of things that he could do. But we find out that instead he just sh uh, chose to let the love of the Lord, the glory of the Lord shine through him. No matter what happened around about him, his eyes were on God and pleasing God. Lord, just let me walk in your will. Just let me please you. No matter what he... Here he's in captivity. But yet he has kind of a nifty little place. And he gets all of these nice king's rich dainties prepared in ways that he had not been trained to eat. Ways that was not pleasing to the Lord. Prepared with fires that were not pleasing to the Lord. And Daniel says, you know, we've got to do something about this. He says, uh, and so he goes to the king's chamberlain, and he says, you know, he said, why don't you just let us eat in this certain way that will please the Lord, and, and it's a very simple way, and, and I know that it's not real fancy, but we'd like to eat that way. And they said, no, Daniel, you can't do that. Why, if you were to look bad at the end of this time, it would be my head. It would be, it, it's, it's my neck. And Daniel said this, there's got to be a way to please God. Hey, why don't we do this for ten days? Let, and, and notice this. And I, I didn't mean to get into this, but Chuck and I have a series on the excellent spirit. This is part of it that we gave it in, in at PTL. But Daniel, he was uh, twice in the book of Daniel. It calls him an excellent spirit. I don't know if you've heard our teaching or not, but on the teaching, excellent means to overhang, to jut out, to go before, to, to go further, like an Eve goes further than the house. That's what excellent means. Or like an icebreaker that hits the ice. You know, this ice, this piece, the icebreaker, this excellent, hits the ice before the rest of the body of the ship fits, hits the ice. And it breaks open. 
that area and the body of the ship goes through safely. Hallelujah. And can follow. I think we all want to be excellent of spirit. That we're opening areas for the rest of the body to flow into. Hallelujah. And we find that even Daniel went and spoke to the, the one that was in charge of him. And here, all of a sudden, we're hearing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're flowing in with him. He's opened it up, and here's the rest of the body there. Hallelujah. What an excellent spirit Daniel was. And so, sure enough, we know the story after ten days. They were more fair, shinier, more glowing faces than any of the others that were there. And it so pleased the authority that they said, you can eat like that. Hallelujah. You got your way. The Lord saw to it. You know, whenever we step forward for God, God will always meet us. Heaven will respond. Hallelujah. And you know, we don't find that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego asked the Lord for anything. Did they? They just, they just wanted to please Him. They just had their eyes on Him. But nothing escapes the Lord's notice. The Lord, I'm telling you, keeps a good set of records. A good set of records. And we need to be sending up the good all the time. Some night, whenever the Lord can't sleep, He'll call for the records. And He'll read in there. And He'll say, oh, I want to reward them for this. This is the time they need it. Hallelujah. And here comes blessings out to meet us. And we, we wonder how oh, the Lord has just filled me full. It's because that He loves us and He's keeping good track. Hallelujah. The, the Lord hearkens, sees it, and hears it. And though they asked the Lord for nothing, the Lord knew what they needed in the future. Did you know that? They didn't know in chapter 2 of their life that they were going to need interpretation of dreams. But in chapter 1, because they had reached out and said, Lord, we want to obey you. We want to please you. We want to stay in your will. Not do anything to offend you. The Bible says that as for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Lord gave them great wisdom. Made them very, very wise. And Daniel. But as for Daniel, he gave Daniel what? Guess what he gave Daniel? Interpretation of dreams. And by George, here comes chapter 2, and their lives are all threatened. They're going to all lose their lives, all the sages, all the seers in the country, because the king was angry, because no one could tell him his dream or give him the interpretation of it. And the king says, enough of this. Sure, I tell you something, and then you give me some kind of answer. Now we're put to the test. What is the dream, and what is the answer? Kill them all. But God, but God, so rich in mercy, knows what we need tomorrow in our life, even when we don't. He's already answering. He's already made a way. He knows the needs and the desires of our heart. And Daniel, that excellent spirit, goes out, juts out ahead and goes to the king. And he says, King, just give me some time. Give me tonight and tomorrow I will bring you the dream. I'll bring you the interpretation. What faith, what confidence in God. He's moving out. He's stepping out. He's declaring what will be. It's time we declare what will be. You know what? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got together and they began to pray. And whenever morning's light came, Daniel had the dream and the interpretation. Daniel goes to the king. He tells the king the dream. He tells the king the interpretation. And the king says, oh, Daniel, this is wonderful. This is wonderful, and blessed be your God. I'm telling you what, when a child of God is faithful to the Lord, is seeking to stay in His will, even the enemy begins to praise that living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many times the king praised the living God, Nebuchadnezzar, because of the lives of these men. How Daniel could have tried to do all kinds of things in his own strength. In his own wisdom. And we can try to do all kinds of things in our own wisdom. But there is a wisdom that is higher than the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world we know is called Gnosis. G-N-O-S-I-S. But there is a what? There is an epi Gnosis. The Bible speaks so many times of Gnosis. And then it will turn around and it will speak of epi. If you look it up, it has a little word in front of it, epi. Gnosis. This is particularly in the New Testament. And epi means what? From above. So we can operate in gnosis. That's great. But the Christian operates in epi-gnosis. Knowledge from above. Hallelujah. 
And Daniel goes before the king, gives him the, 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 the dream and the interpretation. The king is blessing the God of Daniel. Hallelujah. The king is recognizing the God of Daniel. And now the king wants to reward Daniel. What does this, this excellent spirit say? Oh, well, that's great. Oh, I'm just really glad to be rewarded. Oh, this makes me a big man. My goodness, it's just so wonderful. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, y'all come by and see me sometime. No. He says to the king, if you want to help me, if you want to bless me, you've got to know that I did not do this by myself. The rest of the body was with me, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They helped me, and they deserve to be rewarded and honored too if you're going to do anything for anybody. He brings the rest of the body up to the blessing. Hallelujah. Uh, That's an excellent spirit where they're concerned about the body. And the body, the the Lord says, uh, the word says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were appointed head of provinces. They were the rulers over their captors. Hallelujah. See how God works? He always wants us to be over and ruling over our captors. Praise God. Whatever seeks to keep us captive, the Lord wants us there ruling and reigning over it. Them blessing Him. Hallelujah. As for Daniel, he, he stayed in the king's gate. He stayed in the place of authority. That's what gate means. Anytime it talks about the, city of the, the gate of a city, it's talking about the place where business is transacted and the place of authority. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says that whenever a Christian makes an onslaught, even the very gates of hell cannot withstand our onslaught. Even the very authority of hell has no authority to withstand us. Hallelujah. Oh, all of the authority hell can muster up cannot withstand our onslaught. Bless the name of the Lord. We've made an onslaught this weekend. We're going to hold on to it. Hallelujah. We're not going to lose any ground. We're not giving up any ground. We're taking ground all the time. But we have to be aware of it, have a mindset on it. And God's intent for Joseph was the very same way. He may be a prisoner now, but there's coming a morning whenever he's there in that prison. And, you know, he he looks over and here the, the king's butler and the king's baker has awakened and they are very disturbed. They've had dreams. Isn't that wonderful? You know, God can just move any old way he wants to. I tell you, when God gets ready to give a dream, he'll give a dream. If he wants to give a nightmare, he can, he can do that too. He can shake you up. Hallelujah. God is well able. And Joseph, instead of looking over and saying, oh, you've got troubles, don't tell me. I've got enough troubles of my own. Mine, I'm just Look at me. I'm a prisoner. I'm in a foreign country. My brothers have sold me into this camel train. I just, no. No, Joseph still has his eyes on God. He's still flowing and going. Hallelujah. And he's, you know what has happened to him? He's begun to flow in the gifts. Is that right? Yes. Because what does he do? They say, well, we've had dreams and we just feel so bad. Joseph said, well, let me help you. Tell me the dream. I want to help you. I want to minister to you. In his need, in his captivity, boy, he's on an upward incline. Hallelujah. He's walking through it. He's going to come out up there at the palace. Isn't that right? And so the butler tells his dream. And Joseph said, oh, let me give you the interpretation. The interpretation of that is that you will be restored back to serving Pharaoh his cup. And so now encouraged, the baker gives his dream. And Joseph says, not so good for you. You know, this is what's going to happen to you in about three days. And it came to pass. And Joseph said, now when you go, look how much confidence he had in his words. Look how much confidence he had in his moving in the Lord. Because he says to the butler, whenever you go back before Pharaoh, remember me. And sure enough, he did two years later. You know, sometimes things don't always happen the way we want them to happen. In the timing. Oh, God spoils us a lot of times. Doesn't he spoil us? And he causes it to happen right away. But if he doesn't spoil us. We don't give it up. I'll tell you, Friday is on the way. If it's not this Friday, then the next Friday. And if not the next Friday, then the next one. But it'll be the best Friday for me. Hallelujah. It'll be double portion for me. I'll take a double portion. Praise God. And sure enough, one day, what happens? Once again, God says, ah, the timing is right. Joseph is secure in his position. Joseph has his eyes on me. Anything that the enemy has put at him has not moved him. 
Now Joseph is ready to rule Egypt, a mighty country. Not only to rule them, but to keep them safe, to keep them fed, and to minister to other nations around about. Joseph is ready now. And what does he do when Joseph is ready? He puts his thumb on Pharaoh and gives him a dream. A dream that he cannot shake. Because when God puts his thumb on you, you won't shake it. God knows how to do everything. And God put his thumb on, he gave, him, he gave Pharaoh a dream, and then he puts his thumb on it, and he keeps it there until Pharaoh cannot, he cannot move. He cannot do anything. This dream has a meaning. Somehow or other, he knows it has a meaning. But he can't figure out the meaning, and nobody can tell him. And all of a sudden, the butler says, Aha! I now recall something I forgot. There is a man in your prison that can interpret dreams. We need to be flowing and going, folks. Asking God and believing God for giftings. Hallelujah. And moving out beyond our bubble. And no one has the right to say, well, you know, I'm just timid. You know, the Lord, I, I can't do like others, you know. Others jump and dance around and have, I'm timid. I don't buy that. Good. Overcoming. Absolutely. And moving out. And when it, this is why I said the other night, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Because I know that God speaks to us whenever He's moving. And give you an opportunity to share what the Lord had given you. Maybe just a thought. Maybe just a scripture had come to you. Because whenever you move out like that, you begin to find that God will take. And what He's spoken to you, what He's even shared with you in the Word, He'll lead you to someone. And if you are aware, you can minister or lift that one out of bondage by what God has showed you or given you. I wanted to draw you forth, and some of you ministered forth, but I tell you, we should all minister forth whenever we're given the opportunity. Because you know what? Whenever we're exercised in ministering to someone, it lifts them and it lifts us. And him ministering to these, to him ministering to these two, the butler and the baker, lifted him out of prison. The giftings, get this, the giftings, exercising the giftings, lifted him out of prison. Is that right? Is that so? It's so. It wasn't because the butler thought Joseph was so wonderful all that time that he'd been in there with him. But it was whenever he interpreted a dream, whenever he used and allowed the the Spirit to use him and bring forth interpretation of dreams that he was lifted out of prison. And I'm telling you, I can just see it. I love to say this. But I can see that Joseph goes to bed that night. Did you know Joseph was in chains at times? Isn't that right? Psalm says, Psalm says that his feet were hurt in the stocks. Maybe not chains, but the stocks. And it says that his soul went into the iron. It wasn't pleasant. He could have railed on the Lord. He could have said, why did you promise me something didn't bring it to pass? No, he kept the faith. Hallelujah. He kept the faith. Ladies, let's keep the faith. He goes to bed one night, a prisoner. He wakes up the next morning, and he's been commanded to come before Pharaoh. What do they do? They whisk him in and clean him up. He shaves. He puts on a clean, nice robe, one to be presented before Pharaoh. And he gets up there to Pharaoh. Hallelujah. God has set his plan in motion. Destiny has taken over because he's been on that path. He's not staggered. He's not fallen off of it. Hallelujah. And God now is bringing destiny to pass. God will bring our destinies to pass if we just stay on the path of obedience, which keeps us on the path of the plan that he has planned for us. And Joseph goes before Pharaoh. Pharaoh, he tell, uh, Pharaoh gives him the dream. Joseph interprets the dream. And then they say, oh, my Lord, what can we do? What can we do? It just sounds like we're doomed. And they look to Joseph. Isn't this interesting? And Joseph said, well, what I would do. Now, he's, he's talking off the wall right at the spur of the moment. Really, that wall is the rock. You can talk right off the wall, rock. He didn't come prepared. He found out the dream, and immediately, while he's standing, wisdom is coming to him. Epignosis is coming to him. Hallelujah. And he says, well, what would make sense is to appoint somebody who has wisdom and who is, is, has integrity and who can think and have a plan, and they are to, to begin to save up certain amount of the crops during the seven good years that's going to come. The grain is going to come. And then let this man, in his wisdom, uh, begin to dispense it and dispense it in a way that it will last the next 
lean seven years. Find a man like that and make sure he's the right man and you will be safe. It will be well with you. And Pharaoh looks around, I imagine, at the rest of the men that are standing there and probably the, the butler. And he says, well, you know what, fellas? I think we've found the man right here. I think he's wrote his own ticket. Think about it. God, in rewarding Joseph for what he'd been through, not only lifted him out, blessed him, but let him write his own ticket. Let me tell you, can't you imagine the fear? Can't you imagine the thoughts on Potiphar's heart and his wife's heart whenever they found out that Joseph was highest in the land, save for Pharaoh? Highest in the land, ruling the land of his captivity. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'll tell you, whenever the enemy sees that we maintain a peace, whenever he sees that we're walking for God no matter what happens to us, he isn't going to be interested to keep hanging around whenever we just keep gaining and we just keep gaining. In fact, the psalm says, and I thank Billy Brim for this, putting these scriptures together. Oh, thank God for the body. Hallelujah. And Psalms 27, verse 11 tells us this. It says, Show me thy ways. Teach me thy ways, O Lord, and lead me in a plain and even path because of mine enemies. And she said, I looked up mine enemies. And that means the watchers, the enemy who observes me, who is watching. And I want you to know that the enemy is watching you. Watching for any clue that you've weakened in your resolve to serve God, to please God, to overcome, to get out to the end of the valley you've been in on a higher plane. He's watching for that. We have observers, according to the Word of God, our watchers. But here is Joseph. He's not moved by his captivity. He's flowing in in the giftings. He's just moving. He's blessing people all around. He's living in integrity. And even whenever he's in iron, he's still praising God. I imagine he's saying a few courses like Paul and Silas did. Tell you what, you press through whenever you're in prison. Oh, God, help me not to go too far afield. But Paul and Silas, I imagine they looked around at each other and said, well, here we are. Down in the uttermost part of the dungeon, all in these stocks and chains, and our backs have been beaten to a pulp. Why don't we sing? Let's give the Lord a little praise. Let's press through. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas begin to press through, and they begin to praise, and the prisoners all listened. The rest of them were being affected by Paul and Silas in prison. What happened? That old prison could not stand the pressing of that praise and worship. It says that it began to shake. It began to shake. And not only did the walls begin to shake, but it shook from the very foundation. Hallelujah. And you know what happened? We all know the stocks popped off. And here was Paul and Silas. And not only that, they were not only set free, the prisoners were set free. The jailer comes and he's in fear and trembling. And Paul says, don't worry about it. We're here. It's okay. You're not going to get in trouble. We're all still here. We're just praising the Lord. We can't help it if the prison fell apart. (laughs) And I tell you, when you press through in worship and praise, the prison will fall apart. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The prison will fall apart. Hallelujah. And here comes the jailer, and he sees what's happening. What does he do? He begins to wash their wounds. There's been a change. That which has held captive now is ministering. Hallelujah. God's great plan. All these prisoners have been affected. The jailer receives the Lord, and not only him, but his whole household. And let me tell you something. God promises us our household. And this is the year of Jubilee. We've not talked much about it, but if you get into Leviticus chapter 25, you will find out that not only things are to be restored, and we are literally, literally in the year of Jubilee. Not the seven-year Jubilee, but the 50-year Jubilee. Hallelujah. Israel. Natural Israel is in Jubilee. And whatever happens in natural Israel, do you notice? It's what happens here. Spiritually. And spiritually, we can expect things to be restored to us. We can expect properties that we have claimed to begin to come. But not only that. But I tell you, if you look at two places in that chapter, it tells us that the 
don't wrong one another and families will come together. Hallelujah. How many of you have been claiming that since year of Jubilee started? Families will come together. We'll not wrong one another. There's to be peace among our families and peace among our, our, uh, our greater families and, and relationships are to come into peace. Have you been claiming that? That's Jubilee. That's for us. I mean, we're living in it. This is it. Praise God. And the Bible tells us that not only the jailer was saved, gave his heart to the Lord, but his entire family. Oh, how effective they were. How effective they were. Praise God. He wants us ruling and reigning in the land of our captivity. And to tie the scripture up, and I'll close with this, to tie the scripture up there in Psalms, the 27th chapter, the 11th verse, where it says, teach me thy ways and lead me in a plain and even what? Path. I want to be led in that path. I want to stay in that path because I have watchers who are watching me. They're watching to see if I'm going to stagger at your promises, if I'm going to stagger at your word. Lead me, in, lead me in a plain and even path because of those who are observing me, my enemies. And if we turn over, and I want you to turn with me to Philippians, the first chapter, the 28th verse. I'm reading it from the Amplified. <laughs> Don't you like it? And do not for a moment... Be frightened or intimidated in anything by the stocks. Oh, hallelujah, by the chains, by the captivity, by the pit, by Potiphar's house, whatever it may be. Do not for a moment be frightened or intimidated in anything by your opponents and adversaries. For such constancy, such fearlessness, such keeping your eyes on the Lord, such praise and worship. Hallelujah will be a clear sign and proof and seal to them of their impending destruction. Hallelujah. The enemy is watching us. He's watching our attitudes. He's watching what we're saying. And we're just in the Lord. We're just praising Him for what He's doing and how He's going to change our our, our circumstances. And the enemy, I, I, I believe this, that's the most effective way you can resist Satan. If you've resisted Satan with your mouth and it hasn't done any good, begin to have total confidence in the Lord. Total constancy in the Lord. And I'll tell you what, he won't want to hang around very very long to hear that. He can go someplace else and and make headway. He isn't going to make any headway to you. I believe that's the most effective way you can resist Satan and he will flee. Holla. I think he just wants to get out of there. Because what you're doing, Billy brought out, what you're doing, it's like a neon sign. She said, it's just reminding him, you're doomed. You're doomed. That's your destiny. Just wait. Hallelujah. You're doomed. Praise God. So it's a clear sign and proof and seal to them of their impending destruction. But, but, it is a sure token and evidence. Of your deliverance and salvation and that from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God will deliver. God will bring a change. God will bring salvation. I think we ought to stand up and just tell him we believe it. Stand up and praise him. Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. Hallelujah. There is none like thee. None like thee. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We turn our circumstances over to you. We turn the prison circumstances over to you. Lord, there is no captivity that can hold us bondage in bondage, Lord. Hallelujah. Just tell the Lord there is no captivity that can hold me in bondage. The Lord will deliver. The Lord will set me free. And that on a higher plane. When I come through, finances will be greater. The health will be better. I'll have more favor. There'll be promotion on the job. God will cause my enemies to be at peace with me. Poverty will have to make peace with me. Neglect will have to make peace with me. Hallelujah. Ill health will have to make peace. My enemies will be at peace with me. They will not trouble me or bother me. I am set free in Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. I was raised with Him. I am seated together with Him in heavenly places. And I have the mind of Christ. 
Hallelujah. Let's praise him. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.